Okay, so I'm recording. Okay, so we'll just go over some like GDM tidbits real quick. Um, and then Mater can do her <laughs> big talk. Okay, so who do you need to screen for gestational diabetes? The everyone, everyone that's right so everyone qualifies for screening however some people qualify for early screening and so i think the easiest way to think about that is some anybody who has a bmi over 25 and another um and and really if they're physically inactive then that qualifies them for g so basically everyone if you can really look, just look at their bmi and decide and however if you are asian american and your bmi is 23 or greater than you qualify for it with like physical inactivity. Um, okay. okay. So those are, okay. so if you, so that's as early as possible for the high risk okay. and then everyone, okay. right, this up here. Okay. So, so everyone, okay. and it's at 24 to 28 weeks for the high risk. Or ASAP. And however, I do want to say that if you have somebody who is high risk and they pass their early test, then they still have to repeat it at the 24 to 28 weeks. Because what you're trying to find with the early um, screen is if they're pre gestational diabetic, really. Um, and then with the regular 24 to 28 weeks, you're looking to see if they're gestational diabetic because every woman who's pregnant becomes some, ha, has some degree of insulin resistance. It's just, it's just that some people can overcome it and some people can't. And so they get these big juicy placentas and it's got, that makes them more insulin resistant. So that's it. And then how do we screen? So one hour. Yeah. So this is a 50 gram test and then, and you don't have to be fasting. So this is not fasting. And then what is considered abnormal for this one? Yeah, so for our clinic, it's greater than 135. Greater than or equal to 135. I will say when I was in North Carolina, they used to use 135. They had too many people that qualified for the three hour. So they changed it to 140. So, and if you look at the, um, oh my gosh. yeah, isn't that crazy? It's like, you should have almost done it the other way. I know, I know. Um, so if you, it's like that whole bell curve where if you set your, some people use 130, some people use 140. So depending on where you set it, you're going to have more people get faults. Like you're going to have more people that need the three hour if you set it lower. Um, and like, yeah. And then if you fail it, which I hate that term because you can't control it, but it's a three hour and this is a hundred grams and this is fasting. And so there is some barriers to that. Like, so we have to have the woman come in in the morning and at a time where then the lab can do it. So they have to be, so it is fasting. So that's a big deal. And then do you remember what the cutoffs are? Yeah, excellent. That'd be good to know. Um, and so in order to be labeled as failing the test or then being diagnosed with gestation diabetes, how many of these have to be abnormal for you to, yeah, two out of four. So two out of four equals GDM. Excellent. Um, you do have another option for diagnosis, and this would be your two hour. Um, and this one is fasting. This one, I will say, this is a screening test, your one hour, and then this is diagnostic. The two hour is screening and diagnostic, all rolling, rolled into one. Um, do you know what the cutoffs for this one? They're different than the three hours. They're slightly different. And actually just look it up, because I'm afraid like as I'm up here that I'm gonna say the wrong thing. But it's like two or three points um, different. So it's basically, 92, um, and then it has 180, and then it has 153. Okay, yeah. And in order for this one to be considered diagnostic for GDM, you know, what, how many have to be abnormal? Oh, just one out. Yeah. So I will say, I think you could argue 
if you had a fasting abnormal on your two on your three hour, that'd be the equivalent of having a fa fasting abnormal on your two hour. Um, so if, you know, pay attention to that. So if your fasting's abnormal, then I would put them into testing, even if it was the other ones were normal on your OGT on your three hour. Um, but this one is more sensitive. So if you if you just did the two hour on people, it would increase the number of people diagnosed with gestation diabetes from 9% of the population to 18% of the population. So it's way more sensitive. However, the research is like inconclusive right now. They're not sure that it makes for better outcomes. What you're probably doing is finding more people are gonna be GDM A1, meaning that don't need medicines or need extra care, but kind of an exposure of people that have like a propensity eventually towards type two diabetes. But so it's interesting. I think this is this will be another thing I think might change during your career on like things are done. Okay, so then once you get the diagnosis, you have to know um, like what are your goals? Like what blood sugar goals do you have for these women? So what is your fasting goals? What's the 90? You know, um, I will say that multiple sometimes say 90. If you look at the guidelines, it does say 95. Okay. But if you use 90, I, I would take that. Um, so technically it's 95. And then for the one hour postprandial, and actually postprandial blood sugars when you're pregnant is the one time that postprandial blood sugars, there's actually like evidence to support that's what we should be doing. Because otherwise you should be really, like in the non-pregnant, we should be doing correction factors doing preprandial is where the, re it's like, we have a very messed up community wide standard here. <laughs> so, but this is, this is it, postprandial. And then usually people check it um, two hours postprandial. So what's that number that we give them? I think. And then what if, it, some people, if you've ever um, tried to check your blood sugars, it's actually a lot to remember it to do it two hours later. So some people will opt to do it um, one hour postprandial, and that's reasonable. So, do you, the cutoff for that, do you know this one? What your goal is for one hour? Oh, I wrote it there. 140. <laughs> um, so, it's 140. So, that's, a, I think, a good thing to know. And then um, the other thing to be aware of the standard in our, just since I have you guys held hostage here, I will say that. The standard in our clinic setting is that you have somebody who gets diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Your next step should be referral to our pharmacist for diabetes education. Um, if they are going to be, if it's going to be too many days and they need to come in and see somebody in the clinic and get started on checking their blood sugars. And we generally check it four times a day. But be aware that checking, like the test strips are expensive. It's not a dollar a strip. That is really the barrier to care on our patients that don't have insurance or undocumented that aren't going to ever be eligible for um, for Medicaid. Um, so we have them see our diabetes educator right away. And that's really what Wolf wants happening too. Like that's, um, that really is our best care. And we're working, I'm working with the dietitians or, or sorry, our pharmacists, they're wanting to start diabetes education classes. So we've got some th good things in the works and we just have a new brochure for them. So there's some things that we're doing I'm pretty excited about. Um, but at the same time, you basically get, depending on how bad their um, their test results were. So if you have somebody that had a 190 on their one hour, then you would actually just diagnose them with gestational diabetes right there because your pretest probability is so high that they're going to be diabetic. So you just call it right there. Um, but I will give women, I will do a brief diet um, education so I will ask them, like, what are you drinking? And frequently they're drinking a lot of um, like full, like fully leaded pop. Um, so like Coke or Dr. Pepper or Mountain Dew or a lot of juices and milk. Um, and then then I also ask them what they're eating. And a lot of times there is like I've had women eating 12 tortillas a day. Um, seven to 12 tortillas is my most common answer that I when I ask women um, or just like bread. You know, so we just talk about kind of limiting simple carbs. And so I tell them like to only drink water or I kind of do motivational interviewing and they'll frequently be on board with it. 
um, because it's such a short amount of time. And then I have them see a diabetes, edu diabetes educator and they get like three to five days um, to kind of make these diet changes and see what their blood sugars are doing. And then if they're at a goal, then you really need to escalate therapy. So if like what they say is like, if you're out of goal by more than 30%, you should go to the next thing. And the gold standard is actually insulin. But that's a lot for women. I will say in real practice, there's not that many women who are willing to start insulin that quickly. Um, so a lot of times you do start with metformin. Um, but I sometimes see residents just start metformin like right away. And like that, it's really inappropriate because you kind of then kind of kick them into a higher risk category and potentially haven't like health outcomes. Um, so 30% off, then you go with like the next step, metformin or insulin. And for the, also you won't have to know like the details of insulin. That's a lot to go through. And then we do send, if they need medicine, we do send to referral to um, Dr. Wolf. And he is like such a good collaborator that you, you have to make sure that you know that this is a higher risk patient. And so then just some other general things about their care that you have to be aware of, um, kind of just general management. And I think the other thing that I see, like if you have somebody who's gestation diabetic, you have to keep track of them. Like those are ones that you can't just like let loose and just hope that the next person that sees them, like you need to try to schedule several of their appointments out. You need to schedule it more frequently than monthly. Like you really need to do it like weekly to every other week. Um, to make sure they're being seen. Oh, yeah. Um, so in general, you would start if they were GDM A2, meaning that they needed insulin, then you would start doing antepartum testing at what gestational age? And this antepartum testing in our community would be at least weekly BPPs. Some communities um, like where I was before, we would do twice weekly NSTs with one BPP, but um, a BPP would be adequate. This is for our community. And you started at, do you guys know? 32 weeks gestational age. The other thing, and this is like, say that you have somebody who's gestational diabetic, but they're not requiring meds. If they then start to require meds and they're 34 weeks, then you'd start doing the testing then. And then if they have, you start doing ultrasounds, it's it's about every, if they're on insulin, um, it's about every four weeks. So generally speaking, this usually winds up being about 28, 32, 35 to 36. And making sure you have that growth sono in that 35 to 36 is really important because that is how you kind of base your delivery plan. And I, I will say, like with gestational diabetes, when you're not requiring meds, you technically don't have to have a gross on them, but we do in this community. So, cause I'm always like, are you really well controlled? Um, and so even with GDM A1, you don't have to do as much, but get a growth at 35 weeks. And the reason would be like, imagine that you have a baby that's really big. So you might offer primary section. Do you guys remember what gestational weight would, would qualify for that consideration of a primary section? Desired. Your, okay. Yeah. 45. And I will say it's not automatic. I always explain that. I've had women literally laugh out 11 pound babies. And one of my worst associates was on a six pounder. So not all pelvises are made equivalent. So if you have somebody who has a history of like large babies and said, fine, then that's different. But the way that gestational diabetic um, or diabetic babies are born, let me step back. The way that those babies um, put on their weight is more chest and cheek. And like, I just encourage you anytime you have somebody deliver, like look at them and it's pretty striking. Um, and this is why, and then as far as induction, yeah, the ultrasound every four weeks, that's different than the growth ultrasound. So the growth, this was your growth. So this is a complete sauna. So these really are growth. These are full um, sauna. I just want to make sure that 
like if you do some reading, you can actually find that GDM A1 doesn't need any extra, but like, please yeah. do extra. Because <laughs> imagine Dr. Brantley, you know, like you're like, oh, she hasn't had a sauna since she's 20 weeks. Like, you know, yeah. I think I will say that OB leaves scars in your heart and soul with like bad deliveries. And it's like one of the things that's left. We all would like to know how they face. Oh, do you yeah. see it? And then when do you induce somebody that's a uh, gestational diabetic? Right. So in general, it is 39 weeks, but there is, there are times where you would even go earlier, like 37 weeks. A lot of times these women would be more prone to getting preeclampsia, so that'd be 37. And if they have like really poorly controlled, um, then they might do it. But at the same time, you're trying to weigh the benefits and risk. Because women, babies born to women who are diabetic, their lungs mature no, slower. So if she gets delivered, the baby gets delivered early, there's a very high risk that the baby's going to go to the NICU. Okay, perfect. Um, but okay, if you have really uncontrolled triggers, the baby could die in utero. Like, it really is a risk. So that's, I will say, until the last few years, I really didn't see people get induced before 39 weeks. And I feel like we've had a lot bigger um, in, increase in that. The one that I remember that got induced early, we had somebody who was really mentally ill where she didn't like to take her insulin because if she took insulin, then the baby would move and she didn't like it annoyed her. Um, mm -hmm. So that one did get section early, understandably. But in general, it's 39 weeks. And with GDMA1, it's, you can actually go to 41. With that being said, with all the new ARRIVE trial and whatnot, really, I, the standard of care in our community is to deliver them at 39 weeks. But like if you had to do 39, two, it'd be fine. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then the other thing for postpartum, and this is really gestational diabetic. So these are women who didn't start insulin or anything until um, they were pregnant. You stop, or actually even in labor, we'll just say in labor, um, you can, you, it's really gonna depend on how much insulin they're needing. So if they're, if they're diet controlled, they shouldn't need any insulin while they're in labor. If they, oh, I don't know his, Shut off. Um, they shouldn't need anything while they're in labor. If they are in insulin, the standard really is to do an insulin drip if they if they fall outside that. And so there is an order set for that. However, when you go to um, postpartum, I you basically stop their insulin because you really are at risk. Like it can go from shocking amounts. I have seen women be on like 30 units TID like with a big, um, long-acting dose, and go to normal blood sugars postpartum. It's the dampest thing. Like, if I wouldn't have seen it, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, and so I just don't want to make her go hypoglycemic and die. So this is like one of those things, like, you really could harm the patient. So I don't care if she's going to eat that Dr. Pepper and eat her pancakes the next day. Like, that's fine. I don't care if your blood sugar is 300. Um, you're, that's not going to kill you, but blood sugar, you know, a 15 could cause a lot more problems. So you stop the insulin. And then I do counsel all the women, like after, if you've had gestational diabetes, your risk of getting type two diabetes is like 50%. It's really high. And so we do want to screen her for regular diabetes in the next, um, like at her postpartum. So six weeks, six to 12 weeks. And then she needs to be screened at least every three years after that. And then you should refer her to the diabetes prevention program, or at least offer it to her. This is actually so underutilized. This is a full year program um, that lowers their, the risk of this diabetic mom becoming a type two diabetic by like 60%. So it's really like a vaccine for diabetes. It is nationally, it's a, it's like, it's a legit program. You can, um, it's about 400 to $500 to do the program. However, you can go to KU Internal Medicine and it's only 40. Um, and then they get it back if they complete the year. And we actually just applied for a grant to be able to give, like be able to have our patients do it. But this is actually, it's funny. This is one of my husband's um, things he's been trying to get the community to use. And like people, it, it hasn't really picked up. So just know it exists and it really is an amazing thing. But it's, um, I mean, I think we should probably all be doing it because we're American and our risk of diabetes. <laughs> um, but we should be encouraging our patients for that. Um, and I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention that 
even if you have one abnormal value that wasn't up here, that is like a huge risk factor for a shoulder dystocia. So you really should do the diet counseling on anybody who even needs to have a three hour. Um, and I think just reminding women, do you know how much um, extra calories it takes to grow a baby while you're pregnant? One to two. Yeah, one to 300 calories. It's actually quite, quite insulting. Um, to nurse a baby, it's 500. So you really, if you think of what 100 extra calories is, like as Americans, we get that without trying. Like, um, so it's not, it's not true that it's like eating for two. It's like really like 1.05, I don't know, so. How okay. often do you check blood sugars in labor? Is it like oh. Q, Q2 while they're, latent or q4 while they're latent and active it's q2 or i don't know yeah so that's a good question so while they're latent it's like q4 is what i do yeah. like if they're and i so let me let me take a step back so if they are gdm a1 you could argue that you don't really need to check them in labor but frequently attendings will so i think if, on those i would do like q6 or like have them come in with their first blood sugar and then i then i would be feel comfortable being done okay. um if they are insulin requiring and it's going to be a long, then I I can't remember if the order says Q4 or Q2. I think it's Q2 and like Q1 and active. Yeah, it's definitely Q1 and active. Yeah. And so it's a lot of um, it's a lot of blood sugars. And I want to say that Wolf's thing, like he had another, I don't know if I stole it from his outbreak or what, but he, for GDMA, I believe like, it's too active for people who are in the outfits. Okay. Just like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you're kind of bucking. You know, you're kind of risking. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And I will say it's interesting. I mean, I think that we have to do standing orders because I think that that does make medicine safer. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the orders that, like, I think that I a little bit disagree with. Sometimes we give them sugar so that we have to give them insulin, insulin. but like they're not in DKA. And so we're kind of making a problem that we have to treat with this like high risk medicines. I think if you just don't give them the sugar water, then a lot of times you can get by without doing any insulin. And that's probably the safest. And do you know what the it's the standard order? What also yeah. is crazy too is knowing this how often it's for like certain food that comes in, like what their initial blood sugar is. It's like one ten. Is it one ten? Yeah. I thought it was one twenty. It is probably a little bit aggressive. It is like so low. It's so like, I low. That being like, like, yes. Literally just ate dinner. So yeah. 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 Wait, if they get one measure over one ten, they get and so they like get their initial. Take their initial. Yeah, and so you can, um, you can like override that, but like if you, yeah, it's it's pretty aggressive. And you do want the benefit of having the uh, her have tight sugars during well pregnancy and labor is it lowers the risk of baby having hypoglycemia, um, and it just definitely pay attention to the baby after like it's legit like it really does happen um, these big juicy babies that look so good and then they're the ones that have trouble. Do we ever like? I know if they're requiring insulin, we refer them to MFN. Does MFN always control their insulin then? Like, or do they, like, they manage the insulin for like doses and everything? That's a good question. So, the, um, so MFN will kind of do whatever we want. I will say, if you, um, if usually they do take over the insulin dosing, but they will let like uh, we frequently do it with the PharmDs also. So there is like a little bit of variation, um, and you can change it. Like Wolf's not real you know how he is like he's yeah. way more laid back than the average and so if you change the dose and you could just reach out to him and say that you you know you saw her and did it but i think i think the benefit of sending it to wolf is just because we don't always have as much continuity care in our clinic so just making sure that all the right saunas are getting done and all that and it's hard for because like i you know i know what what i need to do but just making sure that it all happens it probably does go smoother if we um go through him yeah, so how do you dose it for pregnant moms? So you get more insulin resistant the far the longer that you've been pregnant. So um so there's different and if they're really obese, you're supposed to add like 0.1 unit. And I will admit 
that I kind of calculate it and then I kind of freak out and then it's two big a doses. And so, and my husband's always like, they're sinks, you're fine. I'm like, oh, I'm good. Um, so generally speaking, I will do like, it's technically 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 per trimester. Like if you're first trimester, it's 0. 0.6, yeah. 0. 0.7 for second trimester, 0. 0.8 so units like, per kilogram. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah. Yeah. Like so you calculate. Yeah. So it's yeah. 0.6 yeah. units per day, and then you increase it to 0.8. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then also, I chicken out, but then it winds up being usually you wind up doing 10 long acting and then five with mills is like a pretty common yeah. scenario. But I think as long as you aggressively increase the dose and like keep track of them, it's probably going to be okay. Like yeah. you've got a little bit of wiggle room, but if you're going to dose them and then have them come back in two weeks, like that wasn't a good plan. Um, so that's the biggest thing. And I actually, where I was before, we would do a lot more NPH and regular and that's like the OB of way doing doing it. So it's like two thirds and one third and you do, so NPH acts for 12 hours mm -hmm. and that's like dirt cheap. And then regular has four hours. So it's, you have to do three meals and then three snacks too. So you're kind of eating to cover your, your mm -hmm. insulin. Yeah. So it's a little bit more complicated, but really now we, we pretty consistently just go with what we're used to. And I would use Levamir over Lantus. Um, Why is that? There, there are some studies in rabbits that it was like a teratogen on Lantus, but it probably is fine. So if somebody's already on it, then that's the risk is probably pretty darn small that Levamir is still kind of considered the preference. And there's no difference between Novolog and Humalog. Um, but we're lucky. I mean, really, our farm D's are, it's really helpful because it takes a lot of time to do the diet education and the, like, checking their blood sugars and all that. But I will say that they frequently have somebody in their family that's diabetic. And so they know more than what you expect at times. And you can even send out stuff and have the pharmacist, like the Walgreens pharmacist, show them some things. I don't feel it's comfortable with that. Um, so I I would try to do a bit. We've talked about doing a didactics where we like actually practice giving ourselves insulin and like checking our blood sugars and not insulin. We would do like saline. Yeah. Just because yeah. that would, I wouldn't <laughs> mind some semi-glutide, but like, so yeah, that's <laughs> like yeah. but um, that's, I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, now that this is my grandpa that's my book that piece was two or three hours just for two weeks ago. Oh, everybody guess how big this That's baby is. Toddler. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the thighs. It's the thighs. Yeah. Okay. Like 12 I have to go with 10 12. pounds. Six ounces. Like, and I'm like, how long is this? We delivered this with a 39 week C section. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 10 pounds, 12 ounces. Freaking toddler. Yeah. yeah. It's the thighs. Wow. I know. I was yeah, like, I mean, definitely oh, cheap. She's so. so also, she's a big, she is like, she's five foot three. Oh, oh really? my god! Her husband is six, six, five or six, six. So her husband's huge. She literally has just for the last couple weeks looked like this, like, oh, like pretty much this. It's just been all. Oh my so, gosh. Oh, hips. oh, I just forget like one teaching That's tidbit so in addition. To, okay. So like type one. So this is different than type one. So when you have somebody who has type type one or type one or type two, then this is the people that you get the echo, mm -hmm. the fetal echo at 24 weeks. And so the reason being, if you have gestational diabetes, you shouldn't be gestational, like you only get eight weeks to make a baby. Um, and so you're not diabetic when you made that baby. So your endocrine heart defect risk shouldn't be increased. Um, but if you have type one or type two, you could have some sugar, some toxic sugar floating around that causes um, birth anomalies. And so if you have an A1C of over 10%, do you know what the percentage of anomalies is? It's 25%. And so endocrine heart defects is like the number one. And then there is a cauda, there's like a neural tube defect that's like pathonomic for um, 
for both types of insulin. Yes. Well, I don't know if it divides. It's just like it just says like if you have an A1C greater than ten percent. So I used to think oh, okay. them together. But and if you have a type one diabetic, those are the ones like refer the. I mean, that's a wolf right away and an endocrine. Those are harder, and they they take smaller amounts of insulin. You know, it's like we're not as used to doing type ones. Okay. I don't know how. I don't know his password. So. The, the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Is Dr. Gary gonna send out that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, yeah, I can put a couple of things in I need to. Yep, I Trying grapes to go home. What are you on? A little surgery. Oh, nice. It's not tonight. Um, Lala and Colossus. Are you on tonight? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Dr. Williams. I'll leave you. If you want to cover your information, it's good. I didn't mean uh, that's my phone and the okay. program evaluation committee. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Okay, so yeah. I, I did not check my phone until yeah. yeah. the okay. okay, but then the next slide we're going to do it. I think I'm on. I'll be on the OB floor. I okay. don't know. Okay. I'll be able to leave. Mm -hmm. I don't know what week that is, but yeah. I'm on OB. That's like on the test. So it's like, yeah, it's a, that's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, but it'll be here though. Yeah. Where I'm, I have it. We currently have it. We're going to have it at Ching, but I think I'm going to make it Freddie Simon. Um, What's the that? third floor. Yeah. At the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know. Turn <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> 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 